the digital transition. The Digital Transition, a podcast series created to assist those tasked with implementing digital strategies, where we will share our knowledge and experiences to support you in your transition. Welcome to The Digital Transition, powered by Bond University's Building Information Modeling Program. I'm your host, Nathan Hildebrandt, and today I'm talking with Mo Sharna from Mortar about how new technologies can assist to improve data connections and streamline processes. But before I start my interview with Mo, I need to talk about our exclusive sponsor, Bond University. Now, Bond University are leading the way in BIM education in Australia through their Master of Building Information Modelling and Integrated Project Information Delivery. Bond University are leading the way in BIM education in Australia through their Master of Building Information Modelling and Integrated Project Delivery course, alongside with their micro-credential offerings. Now, these courses were the first and remain the only university courses to be formally accredited by Building Smart Australasia. The course was also recognised internationally with special mention for leadership in open BIM and education in the professional research category in the 2020 Building Smart International Awards. To learn more about Bond University's BIM offerings, head over to the Bond University website by the link in the show notes to learn more about their educational offerings. Now, over to the conversation with Mo. So thanks very much for taking the time to talk to us today, Mo. Hi, Nathan. Really good to be with you. It's my pleasure. Now, Mo, we've caught up a couple of times online and hopefully we will get to catch up face-to-face one day soon when travel becomes back in the norm. And I know it's opened up over the last 12 months. But for those that are not aware of who you are, Mo, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Also, no, definitely looking forward to coming over to Australia um, at some point. So, yeah, my name is Mo. I'm one of the co-founders of a company called Morta. I'll talk through Morta shortly, but uh, before founding Morta, I worked with one of the largest contractors in the Middle East for a few years, um, and I had done a bachelor's in engineering. I implemented a lot of systems on projects and helped people digitize processes and found that a lot of our information was actually in Excel and Word, which resulted in all kinds of manual processes and meant that organizations um, struggled really to understand where projects were at. So decided to make the jump to found Morta around four and a half years ago. So you, you found that there were issues in the world and in, in, in terms of your job, in terms of processes and information and why it's been managed. So. For those that do not know about what Mortar is, and I know that recently you've been doing some really exciting webinars on on LinkedIn about what Mortar is about. So you could talk about Mortar for a whole forty five minutes, but you know what's the elevator pitch? What what is what is it that's special about Mortar that makes it different? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So simply, we're on a mission to increase data productivity and enable data-driven decision-making within the built environment. That's our core focus. Now, to do that, um, what we're doing is we provide a highly customizable platform that has the flexibility of Excel and Word that people can build their own processes on. In many ways, that can be referred to as a no-code solution. What makes us really different is, one, we're customizable. Two, we connect to a lot of this other solutions within the construction industry. And three, we enable really advanced automation. So it's a very unique offering in many ways. Yeah, it's 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 always it's interesting because it's different um, in, in in several ways, as you're pointing out. So usually, on the one end, you'll have very horizontal, customizable solutions that work across industries. Um, so. Microsoft has a few uh, like other solutions like Airtable and Notion, for example, that are um, no-code solutions that people use. But those tend to be very, very horizontal. They don't specialize in an industry. They're used in everything, um, which means they don't go deep into the processes. On the other hand, you have typical software solutions 
And those tend to come with really hard-coded logic that defines what a process should look like. And that means they have best practices in many ways for how I should manage that specific process, but they're very hard to change if I need to go to a different project that has a different set of requirements, for example, or if I end up in a different region, for example. Um, and we we're, we sit somewhere in between. So we have a lot of the customizability that comes from the, we've taken a lot of inspiration from the horizontal solutions for the essential customizability of the platform, but we are baking in a lot of these best practices so that people can get started with something rather than having to figure out the process on their own or figure out the integrations on their own. Let's start with the big question. And uh, it's, it's a, it's a pertinent one in many ways. And so starting with the big kind of phrase in the room of ISO 19650. Now there's everyone loves touting ISO 19650 is the biggest thing in the world. And for those that haven't listened to any of my podcasts before, ISO 19650 is a standard and it's a series of standards that standardise the process for the specification and delivery of information. There are several podcasts that I have recorded in the past that talk about these concepts uh, and specifically the concepts about information management. Now, may you talk about the challenges that you've faced in industry yourself as a large contractor generating information using software packages that would be deemed probably internationally used by every single different type of organization not just in construction it's used by every sort of businesses out there now that's kind of what people see as the norm but let's talk about the challenges and and because you've been at the coal face you've identified the challenges what are some of the challenges that you are seeing uh, with practices uh, from the delivery side with regards to implementing this in practice in the UK? So I think it boils down to complexity, digital maturity, and the maturity of the different people implementing the standards, and then complete recognition of what information management is meant to be and where it's meant to go. Just before I go into the challenges, I just very quickly talk about what I think 19650 has done a really, really good job at. I think that one of the things we're seeing in the industry, like I've always thought about, there's been this overemphasis on the geometric models or what is traditionally known as BIM. Yep. Um, now, obviously, we all think that BIM should be more. It's not all about geometry. And one of the things that 19650 has done is it has resulted in a lot of people starting to recognize that moving away from information management and BIM is just about geometry and moving into it also includes the documentation it also includes the data that we're going to be collecting and so on and so forth so i definitely think um that's been a really welcome shift and that that's helped push the industry um forward the reality though is that it's really complex to implement. And I don't mean the standard itself is just complex to implement. I mean, the nature of information management in the industry is complex because on the one end, you have increasingly more complicated projects with heavier and heavier data requirements. On the other end, the number of participants that you have involved in the creation, in the production and the management of information is insane. Like you have tens of companies in any project. There are some projects that I'm on that have like even hundreds of uh, subcontractors. And mm. obviously that, that that just makes it very, very difficult to implement consistently across all of these players. And it means there's quite a bit of work done in terms of setting it up and then in administering it and then making sure that people are following the rules of the game that are being set up. So for me, first and foremost, that's the biggest challenge, complexity. Um, comple and, I, and again, I don't, mean the, just, I don't mean the complexity of the standard as much as I mean the complexity of the realities of the built environment on the project. The second thing worth thinking about is the variety of digit of maturity levels when it comes to something like 19650 and um, information management and digitization more broadly within the industry. So what I mean by that is, yeah, you definitely have the tier ones, for example, or the like the big design houses 
all of them recognize that we are shifting into this world where it's all about information and they are looking to develop on these fronts. That is not necessarily the case when it comes to the supply chain members. That is also still not necessarily the case when it comes to the clients, which is um, a problem. We've been lucky enough that we're working with some of the leading clients that actually have a deep understanding of where this is meant to go. But the reality is it's not just the central bodies. It's not just trust. There there are many, many clients that ultimately have to get on board and have to come to grips with what 19650 is really about. And I think we still have a journey there, making sure that everyone is on that uh, same page. So for me, these are, these are the two biggest things. It's complexity and the, the maturity, effectively, of the people involved in implementing the standards. So with the projects that you're involved with in the last few years that you've had your, your tool in place, are you seeing a shift and growth in that maturity? Yeah, definitely. So one of the things that I've actually generally noticed, so when 19650 came out, um, I, I wasn't someone who actually like was involved in the days of Pass 1192, the company that I worked with, wasn't really following standards, even though we were really pushing, I think, the envelope when it came to data. Mm-hmm. So I, I came to the UK around when 19650 was being launched, and I read it, and I was like, this is exactly the type of thing that's needed in, in the industry. Now, I thought directly people will rush to implement it and get it right and so on and so forth and look to digitize the processes. That's what I was talking about. But it it took first a bit of time for people to come to grips with it. And what I've been seeing is over the last two years, the number of people who are now aware of the idea of what is an information delivery plan, for example, what do I have to be checking against my requirements? What kind of requirements am I going to be managing? They've started coming to grips with these processes and understanding the challenges that these processes currently have. Um, And to me, the fact that more people are coming and saying, I need something to make the management of this easier is also a, is, is a sign that more people are now have a, a, a deeper understanding of what it looks like on the ground. The second thing that I'd say, and we can talk about that very deeply if you want, but tools like ours also have a role in making 19650 and other standards to business as usual, because they make them easier to understand. They make them easier to implement. They make it easier for a project manager that isn't necessarily a 19650 expert to co- or a design manager to come in and input the things that are relevant to them from the standard without really feeling that it, like it's all about information management. Now, before we go down that path, I think what would be really good to cover off on because the, the listeners that are listening to this podcast have a either a very low understanding of the standards and these processes because they're on their journey of learning and there's some that would know exactly what we're talking about. But first of all, you know, NICE, ISO 19650 series also introduce the concept of a CDE. And uh, just before we delve into the, the ideas of all of the stuff that we know we want to touch on in regards to the detail as to how all of this can be done better, what is a CDE for the, for the listeners out here that are not aware of what a CDE is? Yeah. Um, CDEs are an interesting one. <laughs> I think different people define them, de- define them in different ways. Let, let's take it with the name first. It's a common data environment. That, that's, that's, what a, that's what it's called. The, the idea of calling it a common data environment is that we want, in this BIM-based world, to share data between each other. And it's a common data environment because it's the environment where all of the different key participants of the project can pull and submit their information. Now, the the challenge with a common data environment is many people see it as one system. So they see it as it's just the place where I upload all of my documents and files, um, for example. Now, that is a component of the common data environment. It's a part of some of the, the things that are needed, but it's not the only thing. Ultimately, a common data environment is a mix of systems that 
allow people to share and transmit the information that they need. And it's not just the files that they have to submit, the PDFs and the model file deliverables and so on and so forth, but it should also be data and information. Now, one of, one of the things that's interesting is here in the UK now, there is this shift trying to start moving from a common data environment to something called an information management platform. But regardless, they'll bo they're both very similar. It's a mix of systems that are needed in order to get people to share, manage, review, um, and specify their information. Coming back to kind of delving into a bit more detail. So for the listeners that didn't understand what a common data environment was, was before, that's kind of a pretty good description. But now stepping back into your role that you had in construction. Like one very simple, sorry, just one very simple analogy on, yeah. on common data environments. Like the, for anyone who, who, who may not have seen it before, but I'm sure almost everyone has used something like a Google Drive or a Dropbox or a OneDrive, for example. Mm -hmm. If you think about it at its most basic form, these solutions are places where people can share files with each other. A common data environment is just an upgraded version of that, um, that A, focuses on data, but B, isn't just focused on internal teams and is focused on a mix of participants that all have access to that one or multiple um, repositories. I like it when we simplify things down even another layer, that's good. Very, very positive thing with a lot of people that live on the uh, Google Drive, Dropbox, all of those, uh, and Box and all those other exciting things. But let's delve into things that CDEs don't actually do because I think this is kind of also a very important piece of the puzzle. So, yes, there is the connectivity. Yes, there's becoming this uh, focus on the potential for it being a database or something that's housing data as well. But I want to touch back on the the scenario that you faced back when you were on the construction side and just imagine there was a cde in place you know this the iso 19650 standard obviously is good in terms of telling you uh, this is what i want this is how i want it delivered it talks about the cde and how that information is to be shared and dealt with between different parties but let's talk about the creation of that information and some of the challenges that you actually faced. And and because there would have been this moment in time where you've gone, I've had enough. <laughs> I've really had enough of this. I can't take it anymore. You know, what what was the what's the moment in time where you've just gone, no, I this is not the smart way of creating things anymore. I and this is partially from where I think a common data environment should be. So before I very quickly, before I talk about my frustration. One thing to note is common data environments and BIM and information management right now are all really driven by one specific purpose for information, which is handover to the client. Mm -hmm. More recently, we're starting to see safety emerge, building safety emerge as a reason why people are thinking about their managing their information. But when they say managing their information, it's usually managing design-related information or information that specifically describes the asset. It is not necessarily information that's commercial. It is not necessarily information for project management. It's not that type of information. It's the information that describes what is in my building um, that really, really takes precedence. Now, my background as a person, I worked a lot in project controls, and I was trying to implement systems for project controls on jobs that were worth hundreds of millions and billions of dollars. Now, one of those things involved collecting progress. So we I was on one of the jobs that I was on had 350 subcontractors and we had a system to manage progress um, measurement within the project that was BIM based. And I'll probably be speaking about that at, at some point because we would literally collect data about every column and every operation that's involved in that column, which meant that the, the, the way that progress was calculated was like, um, very like objective. Every single time I'd have to send them a different Excel file 
for that specific period and ask them to update what if they actually completed. And I then need to import that Excel file into our system in order to run some calculations. Now, I was a 24-year-old guy at that point who was probably like a year out of university. I thought I was like, I was very excited to start working and I wanted to do useful work and think really. And instead, my job basically became emailing people to fill in an Excel file, following up on whether they filled it in, bringing, taking that Excel file and then aggregating information in it into another Excel file and then importing these Excel files into the system. None of it was really looking at the actual progress and like thinking about the things that should be happening on site and so on and so forth. So for me, and, and that's why I wanted to actually start with where I think the common data environment is today and really where I see it potentially going. I, I think ultimately this all comes down to project controls and project management just as well as it does for, we need to make sure that our projects are delivered on time and on budget and to the like the, the quality that's required of us. And ultimately, if we're just aggregating a lot of information in Excel, it's just not an efficient way of doing things. Like people like me get really, re and I'm like everyone I speak to that is currently doing it, it's just really frustrating. Like that's not what you signed up for, days of manipulating Excel files um, to know it. It's it's painful when you have uh, when you when you first start an architectural office, you find yourselves doing uh, internal room elevations and stair details, and and you kind of then get to move on to other more exciting things. But is that where we are at because of the maturity of the market? You know, because several you know you had three hundred and fifty subcontractors on site. We have to come up with processes and systems that are set to the lowest common denominator in a, in a system for a process to work because if it's too complex for the people that are using it, is that what's setting the bar at the moment in terms of a common data environment? Everyone's used to uh, transacting in uh, PDF, IFC, RVTs, Navis work files, Solibri files. Uh, is that because that's the, the digital skill sets or the digital capabilities of the market? And that's where we're missing the efficiency right now because the most efficient outcome could be is that someone's participating or someone's inputting information into a database of sorts. It then connects automatically via an API to inform that process. So therefore, the only role that you'd be playing would be a quality assurance check to see that the subcontractors, you'd go on site and visually inspect to check that they'd done what they said they were doing instead of spending all day on Excel. Is that is that possibly the the point that's slowing us down as an industry at the moment from what you're seeing? I'm, I'm biased here, <laughs> but I, I actually think it's not. So I definitely think there is a maturity problem, like the maturity problem um, to a degree. But I think in this case, actually, it's much, it's been much more of a technical problem. Mm -hmm. um, it, not, not necessarily like not necessarily like highly technical, but it's just the solutions on the market don't necessarily are play a part in that vision, but aren't enough to get us there. Now to explain what I mean by that, like ultimately, a lot of software is premised around the idea of. I need to have a standardized way of doing things. So I need to know the steps that I'm going to be doing and I'm going to need to know what information I'm going to be collecting and so on and so forth. And all of that is hard coded, as I mentioned earlier. Now, the challenge is as much as we want to push for standardization, the built environment is a really, really complex industry. Like if you're looking at a hospital, it's not like a school and it's not like a house and it's not like a high rise tower and that's not like a bridge and, and so on and so forth. They are very different industries. If I'm working in Australia, it's very different if I'm working in the UK and it's different if I'm working in Dubai. Like, well, Ultimately, I think a lot of people say the industry hasn't digitized and hasn't moved out of Excel and Word. But I think the reason for that is because processes change and they need to be customized and they need to be made to fit that specific project or that specific process that someone is looking at. And we haven't until recently had the types of tools 
that are professional like you or me, who isn't necessarily uh, a, a developer, could basically build their own software that's customized to their own needs. Now, I didn't invent this concept. Like we are, we are a company that are that's focused on providing tools that professionals like you and me can build processes on. But we didn't invent this movement. It started a while back. And this category of new software that's starting to emerge is starting to change that. So to be fair to the industry, I'm seeing a lot of people actually go to horizontal horizontal no-code solutions and try to push it really hard to make it do what they want it to do. So I... So, and then that's where I, I, I wanted to say, it's not just, there are people who are, who are finding these solutions and are starting to do mm-hmm. things with them to solve the exact problems that we've been talking about. The solutions that are needed to close the gap that we have in the industry have only really themselves started maturing in the last few years. Now, there's a couple of things I've been thinking about, and it's only because I probably over just under six months ago, did some agile change management centered kind of courses. And it's one of the things that I often think about as being the potential reason why some adoption of this sort of stuff isn't as more broad. And secondly, I kind of think that the, your, your view of the world is based upon the people that you surround yourself with. (laughs) And I'm beginning to think more and more that the reason why we're still having these conversations a decade on from when we first started having them uh, because, you know, Brisbane has, you know, up to its 10th anniversary right now, it, this conversations are the same. Uh, technology, yes, it might be slowing it down and then you're seeing these advancing people, which are probably the top 5% of industry, driving it. Do you think that change management in some ways – has a part to play in all of this? Yes, of course. That would like definitely. One of the most important things is getting the buy-in of people and taking them on these journeys with them. Think usually if you look at digital transformation, the way that it usually happens is someone will have a big pitch or a big utopian vision to connect all of the data and achieve everything that we're talking about, it will come with a massive, massive price tag, but it will come with big change, which is scary. We're going to be changing all of the systems or a lot of the way that we do things. That scares people. There is risk involved in that. There is additional cost that's involved in that. There's additional time that's involved in that. What I think we're moving to is much smaller Digit, like much more gradual digital transformation programs where people start going, I have this use case, but I want to achieve connected data. I want to realize that same big vision and solve the same big problems that um, people have been trying to solve for a long time. But I want to take it step by step and build towards that change so that I get people to buy into the journey with me and to see the benefits of moving in that direction and build momentum towards the bigger shift that we all want to um, cause. So I definitely think change management is is by far one of the biggest problems, like thinking about, and it's a mistake, to be honest, that I made at the beginning. I I would go and tell people, we want to help you connect all of your data. And one one exec once said to me, it's like, Mo, I really like you and you seem like a smart guy and you know what you're talking about and so on and so forth. But there are far more fun ways to torture myself than trying to figure out how to connect all of this data together for an organization of this size. And I just laughed at that point and it did really get me thinking, like that that sentence, because he, he was someone I considered to be someone who's willing to take on hard problems, if, if that makes sense. It's yep. not like the kind of person who doesn't want to take hard problems. But even for him, 
it's just like what it you're talking about is crazy. Like to, to, to get organizations of the size to connect all of their data from all of their disciplines, like it's it's a massive, massive, massive undertaking with a lot of stakeholders involved again that you need to convince and get to buy in and so on and so forth. It's not even the technical problem, it's getting the things you need from everyone to actually get there. So for me, a much more effective way of doing it, what I learned over time is there, you need to take people on that journey. You need to have that as a North Star. Of, I want to digitally transform, but I want to start with smaller use cases that start demonstrating the benefits of moving in that, that approach to build the momentum that's needed to get to the change that we want. Now, it's something I think that upon reflection, when we look at our younger selves and how naive we were, and we know one piece of the puzzle, but we missed that last piece that could have made the difference to... Uh, make it all shift earlier. But the second point that I guess I want to touch on with this is there's change management, which is some of it. But then another piece of the puzzle, which I think could be scaring people off and hindering us from this change, is this whole concept that I'm an architect or I'm an engineer or I'm an asset manager. Most of these kind of tools that have been in the marketplace today have required extensive coding uh, or customization to actually achieve any of this kind of digitization automation from the conversations you've had because you're obviously out there trying to talk about what your tool's doing. Is that been something that people have kind of been saying, well, you know, we don't we don't have this expertise internally. If we had it, we'd be we'd be we would have done it years ago. But, you know, we we're not in the business of doing this. Is that something that you're seeing as a as a barrier before we kind of move into the concept of this no coding solutions? Yeah, definitely. So like as, as you've pinpointed, it's been very, very hard or very costly for people to develop their own applications. Now, what I am seeing is generally speaking, especially the biggest like construction companies and design companies are investing at this point in having software development arms, so to speak. But at the end of the day, they need the resources. They need to learn how to manage these resources. It's costly. They then need to maintain anything they're developing. So they, they see that they see that as a cost. And th- that means a few things. It means, one, there is a resource constraint within the company, which then therefore means they have to really prioritize what it is that they're digitizing. Like ultimately the... There are hundreds of processes within the industry. If they're going, they can't take it on. They can't solve all of the problems that they're that the end users within their companies have. They'll pick and choose what they deem is most critical. Now, it's always important to pick and choose, but it's not great that the reason why we're having to choose is because we're limited on, we're constrained with the resources or the people that can actually. Uh, make this happen. The second thing, and I think that's more, that's even more important is what you really have is the big companies have the resources to potentially create their own software. The company that I used to work with was a top 20 international contractor. We had a massive software development arm. We spent a lot of money on developing our own software because we saw it as potentially competitive advantage. Having said that, 99.9% of the industry does not have the money to build software teams on that scale and, and mm. on that scale and size. Um, so I think it's both there. Are, we don't have enough developers. We don't have enough people. It's expensive um, to make a lot of this happen, which in turn means even if you're, if you're looking at the big companies, they're having to pick and choose which processes do I focus on. I know a lot of information managers that will tell me, we do have developers internally, but they're focused on the project management side of things. They're not really concerned with my problems. And then on the other hand, you have the vast majority of the industry, which are much smaller companies where an industry that's dominated by SMEs, they will not, they cannot afford building their own software. And that means they're locked out of that, or they have been locked out of that for a while. So... Let's talk about these no-code software options that are out there on the market. Do you want to rattle off the ones I know? I, I know there's some fun ones that you like mentioning and uh, 
we have some conversations with uh, Mr. Jackson occasionally about how much he loves some of these other platforms that are out there. But in, in many ways it's important to kind of, you know, have people understand what these platforms are and then they can understand how similar that is also to, to Mortar as itself. Let's first talk through no-code solutions. What, what do they mean? No-code and low-code solutions, yep. I would say, is the general category that we're looking at here. And the idea of a no-code or a low-code solution from the name is you can digitize a process and build a custom software application in many ways using no code or low code. So you either do not have to deal with any of the coding yourself or have any of that know-how, or you can make really light scripts that then help you automate and achieve and like streamline the processes more. What I describe as the, like the OG no-code, low-code tool is Excel right? Because anyone can open Excel, can add the columns that they want for that specific process. So say someone comes at some point and says, I want something related to the building safety bill to track my compliance against the building safety bill, which is a new requirement here in the UK. I can then make a new tracker on Excel in the way that I think is right, that supposedly responds to that problem. And I have now built a mini application that will and solution that will help me tackle that problem that I have. I can then make it even smarter using formulas, potentially, on the one end. And then I can make it even smarter using things like macros. Um, and I'm sure a lot of us have dealt with like or, or just seen Excel files that have macros in them. Uh, they have all kinds of or pains, but at the end of the day, they do automate a process and they do make it um, slightly smarter. But I just like starting there because Excel is the ultimate in many ways, no code, low code tool that the industry has had and that many industries um, use. More recently, you've had Excel, like Excel itself comes with all kinds of problems, right? Like it doesn't have the properties of the database, it's very bad. It, collaborating um, with each other. It's still not that easy to build something on it and so on. And and so most forth. people so still only know 5 to 10% of it. I mean, <laughs> 5 to 10 is like a, a lot. you can do PhDs in Excel. Um, like it, <laughs> I mean, it is a universe, and that's partly why it's misused. Like it's so, it's Powerful. so, the number of things that you can actually do with it is a bit too much <laughs> if you ask me and, and there's very very little control on how that gets done which is um, one of the real issues but yeah 100 percent like uh, very little of what excel i think can be done can be done with excel is is properly understood uh, but uh, like e even if you did get to the point where you could like actually use excel to its full capabilities i think you you could solve a lot of the problems that people start having if i'm really honest um, but having said that, there are really fundamental issues, which are it's not very collaborative. Fundamentally, it isn't a database. So I don't actually specify what data I'm expecting or the type of data. I format it. I can format it as an integer. I can um, uh, format it as a text field or a date field, but I can't define that that's how I want it. So what we're starting to see is over the last, I would say, few years, and maybe even before that, like you've had solutions like Smartsheets, you've had more recently solutions like Airtable, Notion, Coda. Um, if you look at like Confluence from Atlassian, they're all examples, even Asana and uh, Monday.com, they're all, they're all examples of no-code and low-code solutions that are starting to emerge that people can use to build the applications that they need. Another good example is actually Microsoft Power Apps is also, I would say, a no-code, low-code uh, type of solution. So there are, there are a number of these horizontal tools that are out there, um, and people, it always amazes me to see like the amount of, like what people can create with these tools and personally gives me a lot of inspiration. Um, but yeah, there are, there are a number of ones on the market. I would say, though, the biggest by far is Excel. Now, I've used a, a specific tool to actually act as a training platform uh, personally. How did you find it? Well, it was actually good at the time because 
it was a low cost thing as well, right? So this is the whole th- the barriers, right? Me being by myself as an individual in my company at the moment, I ran a conference. The conference was being run face to face, low cost, hardly anyone involved with it, low sponsorship dollars. So you have to be as efficient as you possibly can. How do I provide that information to the delegates at the end of the event? Here you go. Here's a here's a login. You can have access to the video and the training material after the event. And they all had access to it. And it was secure because it was email, two-factor authenticate type stuff to get in to see it. And from my mind, the fun thing is, is that I guarantee you um, once I get my hands on your tool in the near future, it's one of those things where you've designed the tool specific to a certain task and a certain set of frameworks or mind or ideas or processes that you have. Then creative people within industry get their hands on your tool and you get that opportunity then to take it and play with it and you know a really good example that I really love is that when I get the opportunity to see new features of Archicad when it's coming up and I get to see it you know six months ahead of the rest of the industry because I'm under NDA and you're seeing this being demonstrated to you and automatically your mind's starting to tick over as to how you can take that and transform your whole organisation and save time and money. And I think that's kind of key with this. It's that the new solutions that are out here, I think, are possibly out here fixing the challenges that Excel has, right? So if Excel was the OG, the change management process associated with the OG was never done correctly. It was all done wrong because the reason why people only know 5% of the software is because the user interface or the process to achieve those ultimately beautiful outcomes were a step too far ahead of the normal person. Whereas now, and yes, there's some Excel gurus that you see YouTube clips of on site, on on YouTube and the like, you see them showing here, do this cool trick. But the transformation and seeing all of these new tools that are on the market and people are just doing some amazing things with them. I think that's, it's opening the door to, I'll I'll call myself a simple non-coding person. I've got the strategic mind, the process mind, but not the coding part nailed. So that's my flaw. And I'll never be able to do that part, but I can sit there and figure out how I can do things more efficiently and better. And that's what I love about these, these tools is opening up the doors to people who have roles as architects, as engineers, as building owners, the process of putting in these connections, the process of putting in these automations is almost two steps or one step closer than it ever was in Excel, which is probably why it's succeeding so much. Yeah, I think it, uh, I mean, you, you nailed it on the head. Like what I, a lot of people focus on technical innovation in the industry. So you'll have innovation managers and they'll focus on technical innovation. So am I going to buy this new technology that will fundamentally transform the way I work? I think what's really exciting about this category of solutions is they will unlock process innovation. They will they allow the professional to innovate and to respond to problems. And as you said, you have a process brain. You know how it should work. You know that much better than I do. But you haven't until recently, you haven't really had the tools that allow you to innovate with process, that allow you to say, I want to test this and see if this is going to be more efficient. And if I find out that I'm, I'm it's wrong, I'm going to change it two weeks from now. I don't have to wait a whole year until it gets changed. And that completely changes the way you approach things from the get-go because we're finding a lot of people try spending time perfecting everything up front. But that's because they're used to then it going to a developer and them not being able to change it for years. Um, whereas what the no-code, low-code solutions do is I can deploy. We have processes that get deployed for a week, two weeks. We've learned something in the two weeks, and then we directly update it. And that people then start using the updated version. And that that's very important. Like, I think just... Again, like I personally hate the diagram from McKinsey that says that construction is the second lowest digitized, like whatever anyone presents anything on digitization, (laughs) people go, look at us, we're bad. 
I actually, I think it's really, really unfair as a as a as a diagram, to be honest. And it's a re- really like, in some ways, it's a simplistic way of looking at things. Because if you look at the industry, if you look at the number of stakeholders involved in the industry, if you look at the day-to-day problems that people have to face, like I think the industry does have a lot of problem solvers and innovators day-to-day in their jobs. They respond to problems and they fix them and they come up with new solutions. Architects innovate all the time. Um, Project professionals innovate all the time. They just haven't had the digital tools that allow them to digitize their processes and innovate with their processes. And I think that, that, that to me is really exciting because every professional will now not just be able to innovate in the way they're solving the problems, but they'll also be able to build and iterate over the solutions that they think are right. Well, we'll see a lot of people go up dry creek beds. <laughs> <laughs> there'll be there'll be people testing a lot of things out and and completely uh, stuffing it up now that they have the ability to do it. <laughs> that's the thing that scares well, me. But it's a actually, positive, right? It's that, a positive though, right? That, that's a, that that's the, a. It's a positive, but b. That's where people like us come in. Um, so and like I can. I'm, I'm segueing straight into Morta here, to be honest. But like I, because I think that point is actually fundamental to what we're doing as a company. No, now, well, I think I think, no-coded- I think it's a definitely a, a good point to to close it out. So, you know, in terms of segueing into Morta, like what's what's the difference? What's the difference that Morta brings to the table? Like that's that's kind of my key point. I want to be sold on Morta. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's it's effectively what you just said. No code and low code solutions, in many ways, like Excel, again give you an unlimited way of doing things. You can design an IDP in the way that you want, you can design a BIM execution plan in the way that you want, you then need to figure out integrations and like a million things that come with that to get to the process that you're imagining. The problem with that is not everyone is going to get that bit right. And it's actually very, very hard to do, like figuring out how should I implement mm. an information delivery plan on a no-code solution in a way that then helps me track it against what's in the N360 or Aconex and then connect it potentially to something like um, P6 or work package registers. It's not easy to do that at all. And there are a lot of things that need to happen in order to get it there. And what a solution like Morita is coming and doing is it's saying, we do need the flexibility of no code and low code solutions, but we're completely focused on the built environment, which means we're going deep into understanding the potential processes that someone may want to use Morita for. And we're giving them a starting point. We're giving people like you a starting point which then means you're far more likely to get the implementation of Morta right to do what you're trying to do. I've seen a lot of people build things on Airtable. And I'll tell you one thing, they've rebuilt them as if they're in Excel. They have not rebuilt them so that they actually take maximize the benefits of views, of automations and so on and so forth, because they still haven't necessarily been trained on that or they've been interpreted in, in that way. But well, what we're maybe. really trying to do is there is a starting point that they start from. And the, chal- can- the challenge is, is I, I had this conversation with someone the other day, was around the concept of you only can design something based upon what you've experienced in your life. And I think that's possibly and maybe a final barrier to all of this is that it's very difficult for people to see how to do things differently if they've never experienced it before and they've never had it shown to them. And maybe that's another key item in terms of the digital transformation is sharing. Here's a different way of doing this. If you if, if you approach this in a slightly different way, it removes you from that Excel mindset of, you know, here I'm p- pumping in this data here. And it's not as smart as it could be. And and maybe that's probably 
the 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 positive takeaway from from this as as a as a as a podcast in itself is that you know people should go away and actually have a think about exploring more about what they can do and what other people are doing rather than just doing what they do all the time with the tech that they've got right now. Yeah, um, definitely. And I think this also relates to, to two points we raised earlier. One, that's why it's really important to build momentum towards digital transformation. So take it piece by piece and pick specific use cases to test out these no-code solutions with, because then that, that allows people to start seeing what this new world can actually look like and what these solutions can un- unlock. And then the second thing that I think is also really important is the cost state model, because that then also decreases the, the barrier for people to start making the changes and building that confidence. So it's not all about the con- ultimate connected environment. It could be just about one use case that's being improved. Solving one problem. Mo, thank you very much for your time today. Now I have one question for you, and it's the one that all of my guests get asked. What does BIM mean to you, mate? That's, that's <laughs> my, my mentor, my mentor, like my, the, the CIO of the company I used to work with, asked me this question around 2015, and I said, it's a database around construction. To, to me, the most simple way to put it is what BIM should be, or is it's a it's a place that I can retrieve any data that I want from around my building and my scope of work and what I'm trying to do. And if you think about it in this way, that would involve everything that relates from core, like let's say geometry that describes what I'm building or describes the scope all the way down to tracking the resources that are involved to whether it's been completed and whether it's been paid or not. And every single one of these processes to me should be a part of them. No, it's a very positive uh, way to close it out. But thanks very much for your time today, Mo. Awesome. No, thanks a lot for having me. This has been great. So for more information on Mo and Mortar, please head over to the podcast section on the Skewed website for further reading. I look forward to sharing our next podcast with you in a fortnight's time. Until then, good luck with your digital transition, and ours is powered by Bond University's Building Information Modelling Program. Digital transition.